All right, thank you. I'm honored to be here. My name is Dr. Scott Harrington. I'm a family practice physician with the 101st Airborne Division, as you see here. Uh, in 2007, I spent 15 months deployed with the 82nd Airborne Division to a tiny rural area in northeastern Afghanistan. Uh, I'm here to tell you my story, uh, my experiences are from the perspective of a soldier, uh, as a doctor, and as a father. Um, I'm, I'm here to tell you that there's ordinary soldiers out there, and they're doing extraordinary things. And on our, our tiny little fob, thank you. On, on our tiny little fob out there, we saw a tremendous amount of Afghans. And it's this story, this, the medical piece, that I think is not getting enough coverage in the press. And, you know, due to potential lack of support, we're going to end up leaving there before truly our job there is done. So I'll start from the beginning. <laughs> this is my wife, Jennifer. Uh, before I deployed, three weeks before, I learned that uh, she was pregnant with our first child. And of course, I was overjoyed, but uh, and it added to the sting of deployment for sure. And you know, I'm not alone. There's you know, over a million members serving in the military, and you know, they're going through the same things. What they're most concerned while they're getting shot at is whether their relationships are still going to be the same when they get back. So this is I, I love this. You know, here I am on the on the bus as I'm leaving to go deploy. I snap a photo of these of the people saying bye bye to their soldier member, and uh, we have families there, and we also have this kid who's running along with a prolonged goodbye to his father uh, on the bus. And you know, it, it was heartwarming, obviously, but at the same time there was a, a sense of this weight on my heart. Here I am. I, I'm these soldiers' physician. You know. Do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes to bring them home uh, safely? Uh, well, I have to say that, you know, I found out the answer to that question pretty fast because uh, I, I got my feet wet, so to speak. Right away, I had the honor and the priv privilege of treating U.S. soldiers uh, that were wounded in combat. But the thing that helped me the most was that I realized, and I got to exercise that, was I was a part of a team of other doctors, PAs, nurses, medics, highly trained individuals, other surgeons, and together as a team, we worked together to save a tremendous amount of U.S. lives while we were deployed. And this gave me a lot of confidence for the many months that I had left to go in Afghanistan. The story I'll start with today is the one I love to tell um, when people ask me about what my experiences were like. Uh, it starts with an Afghan woman who delivers a baby the baby has respiratory distress and turns blue. Uh, the family grabs the baby. What are they going to do? They're in the middle of Afghanistan. Well, what are they going to do? They're going to take him to a U.S. soldier, right? Well, there's an, a, a patrol, a convoy going across uh, the road there. Uh, uh, and, and luckily on this convoy, there was PFC Batdorf of the 82nd Airborne Division. He got out. He immediately took action and did what he was trained to do. He did CPR on the child put the child in the back of the Humvee, warmed the child, and brought it to our forward operating base. From there, the forward surgical team, headed up by Colonel Shriver out of Walter Reed, they intubated the child, uh, they bagged and breathed for the child, put, we scheduled a medevac right here, and we got the child to an intensive care unit, military facility uh, north of Kabul. Now, I like this story because it paints a broad picture, and it, it shows that, you know, these individuals are putting their lives at risk to help these people of Afghanistan. Uh, you've got everywhere from the medic to the, the convoy soldiers to the, the FST, the surgical team, the hospital, the medics uh, flying in the, the helicopters. It's risky. They get shot at. They, they land, they're, they're vulnerable. So uh, that's one point. But, but the other point is that in Afghanistan, there is no you know, there's no 911, right? You can't just call uh, an ambulance to come pick you up. In, in fact, uh, our medevac system, and we're, we're kind of like the Afghanistan's ER. Uh, we treat life, limb, or eyesight problems, no question asked. And uh, our, our medevac system, as it's flying over Afghanistan, 
of all those medevacs are for Afghan people and not for U.S. soldiers. Um, so, hey, here I am on my base. Uh, every morning when I wake up in the morning, uh, there was 10 to 20 Afghans waiting for, for care. And uh, um, together with our uh, basic uh, aid station, with me and my a couple medics and the forward surgical team, which included uh, two surgeons, a couple of nurses, a handful of medics, we treated over 3,000 Afghan patients in our time when we were deployed. Now, I mean, that sounds like a big number, but it, it's typical. And this is going on throughout the world today. Uh, you think Iraq, uh, you know, Afghanistan, all the, all the small military bases, Haiti, Central America, South America, Africa. I mean, it's, it's happening all throughout the world. Uh, and I'm here today to show you, you know, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some of the people that we saw, some of the cases that we saw. So some of the, the next uh, slides are a little bit... Uh, uh, troubling to see, so just beware. Um, this slide shows that the Afghan people don't even have the very basics. What, what you may notice is that this, this young woman has an enlarged thyroid gland, and the cause of that is lack of iodine. And where does it come from? From iodized salt. And we take this for granted. You know, we've got iodized salt on our table, but it, it preventing us from getting a goiter. The number one cause of goiter throughout the world is iodine deficiency. Um, now, malnourishment is a huge issue in Afghanistan. Uh, up to 40% are underweight and 20% are stunted growth. I mean, you see a child, you think he's uh, three years old. Oh, no, he's six. Yeah, so that is very troubling. Um, another point that this picture brings out is that she's a female. She's in a couple of years, she may hit puberty, and she may never see another doctor again because um, it's culturally it's problematic for them to see a male provider. And there's very few, uh, there's very small amount of education uh, and availability for there to be female providers. Um, Afghanistan is now number one on the UNICEF's infant mortality rate, and they have maybe the top five under maternal mortality rate, and this is probably the biggest issue, is that they have no uh, birth attendants that are trained, or very few. Okay, uh, th these, these two children have burns, and this represents probably the number one patient type that we saw throughout Afghanistan, because they cook on an open fire, and it, it, this happens a lot. They live in very crowded conditions. Um, but what you'll see is, on the top left, you'll see uh, the child was treated with toothpaste, and on the right, uh, the child was treated with raw egg. Now, if that doesn't send the message that these people aren't getting enough medical care, I, I don't know what will, right? Uh, also, one thing that might not be clear is what this shows to me is that they have very little nursing care. That's another huge critical shortfall that they have in Afghanistan. And a wound that you might get from a burn might cause a disabling contracture from your hand, from the scar tissue, or it might end your life. So we were lucky to be able, and we were honored to be able to treat these children uh, and ensure that they had full function and if a contractor developed to get them the surgery that they needed. Okay, uh, we've all had an ear infection, right? Well, and you get an ear infection in Afghanistan and you might cause problems with your hearing. You know, we were able to treat these people with simple medications and, and potentially stop a significantly disabling problem from happening. You know, a, a speaker here that we had first uh, talked about the health care costs in the United States. We're spending anywhere from six to $8,000 uh, per, per capita per, per patient, right, year. Um, and here, they're spending 15 to $20. That's the amount of money that's coming in from the international community. So any care that's given pretty much doubles or uh, potentially triples the, uh, the, the current care that they're getting. Um, th this case represents uh, you know, a man who's had a child who had burns on the torso. I saw him a lot of times as the child was being brought back and forth to get the dressing changes. And, this shows how medicine is a truly a powerful connecting force. I mean, no matter what language you speak, there's nothing more clear and more truly good and rewarding than treating someone when they're sick. 
I mean, when you think about all the things that we do in Afghanistan, building roads, infrastructure, electricity, bringing water to their homes, I mean, medic medical care is immediate. You know, it's humanizing. I mean, we're right there. It's, you're putting your hands on someone. It's a contact sport, you know, so to speak. Uh, you know, so this is an example of how we were able to reach out and help the people of Afghanistan. When they couldn't come to us, we'd bring it to them. Here we are. We've got part of our group here. We have uh, our medical medications on our back. We're walking it up to a mountainside village. It, the military is really unique. I mean, who else is able to, you know, bring the security and the medical supplies they need to these rural and austere environments and who are training this, this, this aspect of medical care on a regular basis? Um, here we are on, on the mountaintop village. We're doing the medical outreach. We're... Uh, we're invited by the, the village elders. And I mean, this is just, I love this slide. It's like, look at, look at these happy faces. You know, this feels good. It, it feels just as good as treating a U.S. soldier. I, there we are. We're, we've got uh, our female medics to treat the females. We've got uh, a deworming campaign because 40% of the children in Afghanistan have some form of intestinal parasites that leads, that leads to their uh, malnourishment. Um, uh, families would send school supplies and shoes and clothes. We would hand these out too, along with the Afghan National Army. And, you know, that, that felt great. But, of course, you're going to come upon a time when you'll see a case where you just don't have that medicine, where you don't have a, what the resources needed for that child. And that, that felt really bad. That was probably the, the worst aspect. But it wasn't as hard to swallow as when the Taliban was stopping us or preventing us because of the security situation from even helping their own people. Now, I want to take a second to talk about the non-governmental organizations that I encountered in my time in Afghanistan. Here, uh, this is a, a picture, this sign is from the Central Asia Institute. And how many have read uh, Greg Mortensen's book, Three Cups of Tea? Well, if you haven't, he's a, it's a great organization. He was a climber in the Hindu Kush mountain range. Uh, he was freezing and starving, and a tribal elder basically saved his life, brought him back to, nursed him back to health. He vowed from that point on to, uh, to help these people, and the way he's doing that is by raising money to build schools for girls. Now, here we are in a mountainous region, uh, getting support from this NGO. Getting the care to the people who need it most probably is the, the females of, of Afghanistan. Um, this child has, uh, is afflicted with clubfoot. Uh, and we saw a lot of these children. And this is potentially disabling and later on uh, stigmatizing uh, disease. Um, we utilized heavily uh, the Cure Hospital in Kabul. And this is a great organization that was brought, off, uh, brought about by a gentleman named Dr. Scott Harrison. No relation, but pretty sounds name sounds pretty close. Uh, he, he started in Africa, and he's an orthopedic doctor doing uh, uh, curing clubfoot things like that. Um, and since 2005, he has been uh, working in Kab his organization has been working in Kabul to uh, treat these issues. Um, I have to mention that the, that this here is a basic health center. Uh, it's basically where the Afghans get their health care. And they're dotted all throughout the Afghanistan countryside uh, landscape. And 90% of Afghans' medical care is through these uh, basic health centers. And 90% of that health care is paid for by non-governmental organizations. So organizations outside their country, um, and this, this leads me to believe that they're highly vulnerable I mean, and offer a, very, a variable uh, level of medical care and they're highly susceptible to the security situation uh, and to the situation, where, uh, the political and economic situation back in their homeland. So um, I'm, just, I'm just happy that from the fact that the U.S. is there offering a level of security that, uh, that helps these organizations provide the medical care to the Afghanistan people. And this is a tribal elder, and he, he just wants what we all want, security, welfare and the prosperity of his children. And, you know, he's got a very distrusting glance there looking at us. Uh, and, you know, it's warranted. This man has lived through war with Russians. 
And after that, civil war and harsh takeover by the Taliban. And now the war with the United States and the Taliban, literally in his own backyard. And as Ashraf Ghani put it, he's a former finance minister of Afghanistan, and he spoke in a TED lecture. He said, the number one complaint by, or concern by the Afghan people is that they will be abandoned by the U.S. and the international community, and that their country will once again fall into civil war. So I just want to say thank you for letting me talk to you today, and I hope that I've been able to give you the other side of the war in Afghanistan. And I hope that you can see that we're helping to win the hearts and minds of the people there. And I will ask you, as members of the audience, is when you go home tonight and you see your friends and family, let them know that the American military is helping disadvantaged people all throughout the world and to continue supporting our efforts abroad. My name is Dr. Scott Harrington. Thank you for your support. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for your service. I appreciate it.